And we are going to have a Health Friday conversation like we have been having in the last couple of weeks. Dr. Marcy Korir from the Standard Group is here. She is the editor for everything health, science, environment, Climate. Uh, climate. <laughs> super, super editor. She, uh, super editor. <laughs> She's here with us. And the CEO of the NHIF is as well with us in the studio, Dr. Peter Camuño. Before we say good morning to them, let me tell you today's proverb. It's an ancient Egyptian proverb. Or you want to say it, Ndu? No, please say it. It's, it's a validating proverb. It's Friday. Hmm? We're going into a long weekend. People are broke. Mm. And so today's proverb says, Take the fare from him who is wealthy and let pass him who is poor. I mean, mm -hmm. take fare from the rich. <laughs> Leave the poor alone. Leave the poor alone. <laughs> well, a good uh, translation of this or interpretation of this was given by Ben Omolo earlier. You know, it's about looking at tax the wealthy. Mm -hmm. Just leave the poor. Tax the wealthy leave the poor the reason why i picked this proverb today is not just because it's friday people are broke and all those things but it's because now nhif is mandatory contribution and the person who's taking the fare is in the studio <laughs> dr peter camunio <laughs> good morning good morning eric and do good morning good to have you on the show again uh, it's indeed a pleasure to be here all the time karibu sana asante sana Say hello to Marcy for us. <laughs> My colleague, yes. super editor. <laughs> How are you, Marcy? Very well, Doc. How are you? Very well. Yeah, good to see you. Good to see you too. Yeah. Karibuni sana. We're so going nice. to talk about, you know, the opportunities, the challenges, the journey towards the realization of universal health coverage in the country. We know the government has said, and it's very clear that <clears throat> NHIF is designed to be the anchor of the realization of UHC. The CEO of NHIF is here. Have we had a conversation with you? Yes, we've had a conversation. No, we've not had a conversation with you since the passage of the new NHIF Act. We talked with mm. you when it was in uh, the Senate, just before it passed Senate and went to the National Assembly, uh, no, to the President for assent. Correct. Regulations were then uh, published and circulated, and there was a lot of controversy around these regulations. Correct. What do you mean that I can, yeah. you, uh, if I don't pay, as you uh, get to you, what penalties do you do, uh, what and the other? <laughs> Are they in effect now? Um, thank you, Eric. And uh, yes, and thank you for the support that time as we were pushing for the act. And, uh, you know, as when it was assented to by His Excellency, the former president, on the 10th of January this year, the act is actually geared to ensure that we get to UHC. And uh, the regulations are what we are going to use to ensure that we operationalize the act. Mm -hmm. Though right now there's a bit of um, uh, there's a court injunction and uh, we're in conversation with um, FKE mm -hmm. so that we clarify to ensure that um, everything is all inclusive and we don't leave anyone behind. Mm -hmm. So right now we're in that process. However, we've got a few things to celebrate. And I think the first one is actually the change of the name mm -hmm. of from National Hospital insurance fund to national health insurance fund and the, what that means is that uh, by that act it's given us more scope to ensure that we are able to incorporate more healthcare professionals mm. to be able to be contracted so right now we can contract uh, uh, you know consultants we can contract laboratories we can contract pharmacies and you've seen even with the new manifesto that we need to look at how to contain the costs of those other um, uh, auxiliary benefits of health mm. that contribute to increased healthcare costs. Okay. Mm. Now, you, now you've mentioned manifesto. We were discussing the manifesto last week <coughs> with Dr. Masi, and we touched on some of the areas that uh, the manifesto, the Kenya Kwanzaa manifesto had talked about, which, mm -hmm. what are those words? The R words. Is it restructure and redo what to the NHS? There's an RE word that we couldn't figure, we couldn't remember. Re I don't know. But what I know is um, big on, big on touching on NHIF yes. was to do what they say, create Chinese walls uh, between the fund manager, the claims, and I think the other one was on quality, so that you have like three uh, separate arms, eh? so yep. that um, they are running sort of like how we manage the pension funds. I think that was one of them. The other thing was um, to change, now that it's mandatory, to a household contribution. 
as opposed to individual contribution where in one household both of you are contributing for the same benefits. Um, and the idea around that was to increase the revenue from 50 billion to 200 billion from 12 million households in the country. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's it. So is it something <coughs> doable? Uh, well, actually starting with the, with the contributions, and that has been handled uh, quite um, a bit in the, in the act, mm -hmm. um, is uh, the contributions as they are right now is mm -hmm. actually per household, especially for the informal sector mm -hmm. or the voluntary contributors. It is per household. The contributions for the statutory is based on a person's employment, and that should be encouraged. Um, even today's proverb actually uh, is, is, is spot on on that <laughs> yeah, because um, in, in social health insurance, it's a pool. It's a pool. So those who are able more contribute so that to support those who are, are not able. Yeah. And uh, you know also it's been, been embedded in the act that uh, the government is mandated to identify and support the indigents. Yeah. And these are those folks who cannot afford basic necessities of life, mm -hmm. you know, including healthcare. Mm -hmm. And there are 5.1 million households. So how do we ensure that we create a pool that's able to support all that? So um, it is indeed uh, uh, good, and I think it's reiterating actually what the spirit is already, because the contribution for the informal sector is... <coughs> is uh, per household. Now, on the issue of, um, uh, you know, the Chinese walls, mm -hmm. actually that is the operation of um, an insurer. Yeah, And the restructuring that we're doing right now, mm -hmm. uh, ongoing at the fund, is to ensure that uh, we have, um, you know, departments that are, uh, you know, not overlapping. Mm -hmm. You know, like you have your claims department, which is strictly claims and the people there just deal with that you have the case management you have um, um, the team dealing with uh, with collections and the customer experience yeah. etc and this is the key reform that we're in the process of uh, of executing right now so this is um, they, they should not sit separately uh, like in separate institutions mm -hmm. because they, they 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 work together because the people who are collecting are insuring and the people who are following up and then the people who are paying because their their kpis are also uh, uh, facing different directions, mm. but they need to be under the mm. same umbrella where main thing is to protect the fund and ensure that people get uh, access to quality care. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Um, so this, this Chinese walls were to have the funds with a custodian, NHIF as the quality assurance, and then a different entity does the claim settlement. So I think the, the idea is to really separate completely so that there is no yes they should work together but i think in that working together then there is risk of fraud and collusion so maybe that's why they so not be a department but be a completely different entity like break up nhif into three different institutions uh. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay those are elements uh, mm -hmm. you, you the operating rhythm of an insurance company is a daily operating rhythm mm. Every day there are people joining, mm -hmm. every day there are people going to hospital, every day there are claims being processed mm -hmm. and being paid. And in fact, one of the key achievements that we've had is increasing the claims payout and the turnaround time for, you know, the current claims. Mm. So, and that is what should be encouraged. With proper reporting, mm -hmm. that information and visibility is there. Just like you see also in private insurance the, with the reporting that they do. So the issue of... Um, uh, uh, Transparency is, mm. is taken care of. The issue of efficiency is taken care of. So it is best to do it that way. And, uh, but to have very clear, you know, roles um, as it is done anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So because of that operating rhythm, if you put them in separate institutions, you will definitely introduce um, inefficiencies mm. and, uh, and uh, you know, divergent... Um, uh, uh, what what do you call uh, KPIs basically? Mm. Yeah. People pulling in different, in different directions. directions. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Taking into consideration the real situation today, mm. looking at the practice yeah. of NHIF, that you have your card because now this is it, isn't it? Yeah. That mm -hmm. it's the millions of people who are seeking health care um, at any facility. Are we at the point that NHIF or to be when it comes to the delivery of healthcare 
that is then paid for based on your contribution. We're not even talking about aspirational. Where do mm -hmm. you want to be? Do you want all 50 million people in the country to be covered regardless? Uh, do we currently have 10 million? Mm -mm. For those where they are today, is it guaranteed that wherever you walk, wherever you are in the country, if you walk into a health facility with your up-to-date card, are you guaranteed that you will get the health services that you require all covered with that card? Do. Mm. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. Mm -hmm. In the year, uh, we've just concluded financial year, 90% of all the contributions we collected, we paid out as claims. Mm -hmm. That means that all those individuals that we've paid for to the hospitals got services. Mm -hmm. And right now, anyone who is valid is eligible to get all our suit of benefits, which is um, uh, over 10 uh, different packages, mm. an inpatient and outpatient. And we are talking about, um, if you look at a good example, let's say people on dialysis, for example, mm. Um, we're paying close to about four billion in terms of dialysis. You can count how many lives those ones are being saved. Mm. So, with a valid card, with our over seven thousand six hundred providers right now countrywide, mm. that is a sure bet. So, the seventy-four billion we paid in claims is not money. Look at that as lives saved. Look at that as livelihoods saved, because we know. And uh, another great point also in the manifesto, that 36% of Kenyans are one illness away from poverty. From poverty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that is a fact because we know one million Kenyans become poor every year. Mm. So indeed, do if your card is active, mm. you and God forbid, but should you need to, mm. you can access services. Mm -hmm. yes. But when you say 90%, did you say 90 or 96%? 90%. of all contributions yeah. in that financial year were paid out as benefits. Correct. Is that a good thing or is that a dangerous thing? Because not everybody who contributed sought the service, but 90% yes. of the money that you had yes. went to pay claims. Yes. Great question, Eric. And uh, that is actually good. Why? Because with, um, when you look at insurance, uh, based on um, the revenue that you collect, uh, you'd find private insurance would, would budget for 75% to go to pay claims and then the balance for administration and commissions, etc. And for us, our target as a social health insurer is that we pay out up to 85%. But also, remember, the premium you pay and the benefit you get mm. are also night and day. Like a whole household pays 6,000 shillings annually. So a household is um, uh, the principal, spouse, and children up to whatever number. Mm. And they, are, they can access all the benefits. If, for example, one of them, and I'll use dialysis again because that was very topical a few months ago. Yeah. That means that that family, that one person getting dialysis gets up to 936,000 shillings worth of benefits. Okay. And remember, they paid only 6,000 6, shillings. Mm. Anyone who um, needs to go to, to deliver, we would reimburse the hospital 30,000. And the household paid mm. um, 6,000. 6, Anyone who goes for um, specialized surgery, will pay anywhere between 450 to 500,000. And you paid what? 6,000. 17 shillings a day. Mm -hmm. So that is why um, um, uh, that is the threshold. Because in the calculation, you know that an X percent of the population will become sick. X percent will, will have uh, this type of illness, will require surgery. And that's how we do our actuarial um, projections mm -hmm. to come up with the budgets of um, um, and uh, working towards 85. Mm -hmm. Now, when you have anything in the environment that changes that, that's what can throw it off. For example, if you have uh, uh, an epidemic, for example, if you have um, things like fraud, would skew those numbers. Mm -hmm. But um, actually calculated, that is the target that we are looking at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's an issue then of... Um how you identify the service providers and the kind of contracts yeah. you sign with the service providers. Yes. That was a big issue uh, a couple of months ago. Yeah. In fact, now you still haven't resolved it, have you? Because you're still talking about, as we, as we keep having conversations, let's yeah. just renew it temporarily. What is it that you are haggling with yeah. the hospitals over? Yeah, one of the key reforms that we were doing 
is the benefit package and also the way we engage with our providers. Mm -hmm. So the big thing that we are able to do in the new contracts that we have with our providers is we are able to standardize. We are able to standardize our reimbursement based on whatever care level. That's a Kenya Essential Package for Health. So you have um, like a level two is a dispensary up the, all the way to a level six, which is a, um, a, a referral hospital. Mm. So whether it's public, private or faith-based, we are able to standardize across because before there were discrepancies that you could hear we were paying certain hospitals less, certain hospitals more. So that is creating equity. Mm. Then secondly, we expanded our benefit packages. For example, the surgical packages increased about twice. Mm -hmm. uh, we also um, in, in included other preventive uh, um, interventions, you know, like uh, mammographies, etc. Mm. So with increased benefit package, actually, which was uh, uh, and worked together with the Ministry of Health uh, to come up, which we, we dubbed it um, the UHC Super Cover, mm. uh, we had to also negotiate with the providers. Remember, the contributions we get are finite. Mm. Yeah, and payout is it can vary mm -hmm. so we had to negotiate on a sweet spot to be able to reimburse and that was a negotiation that took some time because nhif is also unique that our provider panel includes both public private and faith-based mm. yeah and like other social health insurers that access is only to public hospitals so we had to get the buy-in and we're able to do that so and this time round even in our new contracting cycle of 2022-2024 uh, we've ensured that we input that matrix that we've agreed because now it is standardized, it is transparent into the system. And now we're in the process of rolling out the physical contracts for all the public hospitals that has already been done. For the private hospitals, we're working on it and to be done by the end of this month. Mm -hmm. But services are still going on. Services are going on. Yes. The story in the paper today. All right. So it seems as though you then have been sanctioned over cancelled medical cover right and this is for senior secondary schools that they were looking at and the board seems to have a bit of an issue having said that there's a bit of a war that's going on still looking at medical cover right um the chair has termed as insubordination on your part the decision to cancel contracts of 17 healthcare service providers for school cover and has said that the board has called a meeting to hear your explanation now we don't know if this explanation has taken place, but now here we are and asking you exactly what's going on here because 17 contracts have been cancelled by yourself. You've gone on to say that the reason why this has happened is because they've come to the end of their contract term and investigations are going on to find out whether they will be renewed or if that has come to a head. But it seems as though there's a saga going on here and that there's a war. There's no war. Okay. That sounds like um, an over-sensationalized story, but I'll put um, some context um, to it. Mm. One of the key mandates of the fund is to protect the funds of the contributors. Mm -hmm. And um, the other one is to ensure that we are able to pay for valid services. So our members, when they go to hospital, mm. one of the key drivers of uh, healthcare costs, apart from increased inputs, etc., mm. is is fraud, mm -hmm. and we know that uh, many people have um, um, estimated the cost of fraud to be between twenty and thirty percent. Mm -hmm. In fact, the Duran Institute um, estimates it at about thirty percent. Right. Now, we have mechanisms that um, are able to get red flags and identify. So, and when this happens. Mm. Uh, we have a team that investigates and ensures that the services being provided are valid. And when an anomaly is found, yeah, there is a process that is stipulated in the contract. And when investigations are going on, after the investigations are done, there's also another process of how to deal with uh, the providers who are found to have had um, any malpractice. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it could be through acts of commission, sometimes it's acts of omission. Mm -hmm. And once that is found out, they, they are reinstated and they move on. And like this particular 17 providers being mentioned, there's no <coughs> contract that was canceled. Actually, it's because we are in the middle of renewing contracts mm. that um, 
uh, they've been informed that for the benefit uh, that um, was being investigated, and it was being investigated by a multi-sectoral team, mm -hmm. which included also officers from the Ministry of Education and our internal auditors. So it's a process that is still ongoing. And right now, they can still see our members, but for the services for Eduafia, because that's what was being investigated, that, that has been halted pending mm. the conclusion of the investigations. Mm -hmm. So you've and only halted right Eduafia, but everything else is yes, available. Yes, following their appeals. Because we, we remember, as, as the national social insurer, mm. our aim and spirit is to leave no one behind. So it's to have all providers we work together. But another mandate is to protect the fund. So when there are red flags, we must ensure that we address that without uh, uh, compromising contributions. What's the procedure members. to be followed in such a case? Should you go to the board and seek the board's authority to commence investigations and to suspend uh, aspects of a contract? Or is this something that you as a CEO are allowed by the NHIF Act? Yeah. Once, once um, um, there is a suspicion of fraud, yeah, uh, in, in the contract, is they, they can be suspended. And the suspension is stipulated it's for 90 days mm -hmm. now pending the investigations. Because once you suspect something, you cannot let something continue. And within that period, uh, also the, the provider can, can come back and show evidence of whether it's for or against, etc. And same for the team. Mm -hmm. And then that also is presented now to the board eventually to make the final decision. And this is usually done. And like, for example, in this case, um, uh, we, we, uh, our internal auditors um, 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 gave a report, mm. and uh, that is a procedure. So suspension happens immediately because you cannot suspension let... Suspension is the decision of the CEO. Correct. It's a decision of management. It's, it's a management decision, yes. not necessarily a board decision. Yes, yes. and it is, it's time-bound. Okay. So it's for 90, up to 90 days pending, and then that needs to be presented to the board uh, now for the determination of whether it is a two-year you know, suspension, whether it's a complete... <laughs> Uh, removal from our panel, mm. etc. Yes. When you say there's no war, it's an oversensationalization of the story and all. Yeah. Why would the chairman go to the media to say that the CEO has usurped the role of the board in something that then you're claiming is the role of management? Why would it, why is it playing out in the media? Uh, I, I, I would not be able. Now you're asking me about it in, in the media, so I'm responding. <laughs> you're now saying that it's I would not, not be a able war. to answer. I mean, so yeah. if it's not a war, why is it here? <laughs> <laughs> No, it is definitely not a war. And uh, if there is um, a misunderstanding, I think that is something that can be can be addressed. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, in the in the same line of Eduafi, and we've had this conversation, um, is there a way to simplify NHIF? I call it. We have so many ports. You have a Linda Mama port. You have an Eduafi port. Then the Supercover. The civil servants. These indigents. Now these old. Um, for the elderly, mm. yeah. some of these things will overlap. For yeah. example, if you take Supercover and Eduafia, yeah. um, one household who has children in high school, will the children are covered on both sides. Is there a way of simplifying all of this such that you do not have to have all these different ports because some then probably get used up some more some underutilized i don't know i find that it brings a lot of confusion and inefficiency yeah no great a actually the the covers that we have we have two uh basic covers mm. i mean two covers we have the super cover which is the national health scheme cover mm -hmm. and then we have uh an enhanced cover which is mostly for government to government. So that's the one for civil servants, the police, the county, um, etc. So under the national scheme cover, the super cover, mm. that's where we have um, first the two groups, the statutory contributors yeah. and the informal sector. So formal and informal sector. Then we have another group under that national scheme, which is the sponsored. Mm -hmm. Now, under the sponsored, we have different groups. You have the health insurance subsidy program for elderly uh, mm -hmm. and uh, severely disabled and orphaned and vulnerable children. Yeah. So, but they enjoy exactly the same benefit as in the national scheme. Then now let's come to the Linda Mama. Linda Mama is a very unique program. It's a unique program in that you don't even have to be an NHF member. You just mm -hmm. have to be an expectant 
uh, um, lady in, uh, in this country mm. and you register. And then you'd be able to have access to supervised delivery. And um, every year we take care of an average of a million patients. And last year we had over 800,000 supervised deliveries. So these are lives potentially saved. Mm. And saved. So Linda then, Mama is yes. not only it's not for members. It's, it's for not for members. Any person who any expectant exactly. mother. Mm. Exactly. All right. And then Eduafia is also unique in that these are secondary school students who now have access to that enhanced cover. So it is beyond. So this is to ensure that those students do not have any shortcoming because you know as a social health insurer there are limits that mm. we get to but the enhanced cover that we have like for the civil servants it is expanded the limits are bigger um, um, the access is more so that is the uniqueness of eduafia mm. to ensure that the students are not compromised and also the families are not exposed to any point for a child who has the potential to become a future leader does a parent have to be a contributor for a child to benefit from eduafia um actually not so as long not. as you are yes um below 18 or you are registered in a school yes public or private uh public public school, public schools mm -hmm. you get to access eduafia correct it's a good one i have got to say yeah. that mm -hmm. it's a good one i had heard about it but i had not experienced it until a friend of mine nation and i've told this story many times uh has a son in secondary school who has enjoyed the benefits and continues to enjoy the benefits of eduafia in uh, facilities uh, going through c cancer treatment and he keeps saying this thing i have seen the work that it does there are very many questions though on access to eduafia and whether facilities actually n know what what eduafia is all about let's yeah. talk about that after the break okay. peter kamunyo dr peter kamunyo is the ceo of the nhif he's here with us today alongside Dr. Marcy Korir, who is always here on Fridays from 9 to 10 a.m. having a Health Friday conversation. We are talking about NHIF's role in the realization of UHC, where the opportunities are, where the challenges are, and what we can do so we can all head towards that journey of universal health coverage. 26 minutes to 10, time for us to take a break. This is The Situation Room, the only way to start your day. Mornings done right. 94.4 Spice FM. Dr. Peter Camuño, the CEO of NHIF. Think Out Loud says the CEO seems not to understand that Linda Mama is not functional in many, not only private, but also government hospitals. I get ground. I own a vitu. We got a vote. Respond to that. Are you aware that there are places where Linda Mama is? I've heard of. Yeah. Mm. Um, yes, mm. because uh, for Linda Mama is a specific contract. And uh, Linda Mama, as you know, is actually funded uh, by the government. So we have a different rate for Linda Mama. And the hospitals that do provide Linda Mama are uh, contracted and um, allowed to do that. Yeah. So you'd find a lot of the hospitals doing that. Uh, mostly faith-based institutions and uh, some private institutions and then mostly also public institutions. And uh, those are the ones that we reimburse. And uh, if you remember, actually, even last year, mm. um, early, when there was a, a slight delay in reimbursement, uh, there was a lot of hue and cry. But uh, luckily, after the funds came through, we were able to reimburse the hospitals. So indeed, it does. It's not all hospitals. It's the hospitals that have agreed on that reimbursement rate mm. for Linda Mama. Okay. How yeah. does one tell? How does one tell? It's because you, you will be registered at that facility when you go. So if you're, if you're expectant and you go to a facility, uh, then you can. And also on our website, be able to see um, uh, um, areas or even any of our branches. If you call or our toll-free line, you call and you'll be able to guide it to which facilities near you are accessible to Linda Mama. Okay. Mm. Yeah. I think that segues then, sorry, Dr. I think that segues then into... Yeah the issue of spread of information in terms of then exactly what you can do with yes. your card. Yes. Mm -hmm. you, if you have your NHIF card, mm -hmm. and I, I keep going back to this because I really do feel that there are lots of people who don't know actually that with this card, I can get one, two, three done. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the spread of that information, and really, I think really basically, what can you do? If I have my card today and I'm feeling a certain type of way, 
uh, and I live out wherever, can I go to a health facility, present my card and get treated without spending a shilling? And then what do I, if I have something a little bit more complicated, do I have the assurance that somebody's not going to come and tell me, oh, okay, pay X amount and then we will do this mm -hmm. or do so we can get you a letter because I've heard this. Yeah. Pay X amount so that I can get you a letter so that NHIF can cover you. <laughs> Truth be told, that's mm -hmm. what's going on. Or even that you pay your own ambulance yes. to yes. be referred to the next place. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what exactly do you have or, or not have? We, we actually have, even uh, these new contracts that we've done have actually <laughs> gone to simplify that process because mm -hmm. now we just have two types of contracts. What we call comprehensive contracts, which is you walk in and walk out without paying a single shilling. And that's what we really had to negotiate with a lot of our providers to accept those rates so that our members, valid members, will walk in and walk out without paying. Mm -hmm. And then we have the non-comprehensive contracts whereby uh, you, you, what we reimburse is um, like the rebates and certain specialized uh, uh, treatments. Mm. And for other treatment, then you'd have to pay uh, uh, from pocket. But the bulk of our facilities now are the ones on comprehensive contract that you can walk in and walk out without paying a single shilling. Uh, communication is actually a big challenge. Mm. And um, I will own up to that because uh, we, we've been trying and uh, we actually had a study uh, uh, just about... Um, uh, close to six months or so to see how do we communicate to different types of people, people in different regions, mm. people of different social economic status to understand because the product is the same, but the delivery of the message has to be different. So that is, and, and I would actually uh, implore on, on you guys to also help us mm. in terms of communicating this because NHIF is designed, is designed to save and to take us towards getting to universal health coverage. Mm. The benefits that are available are actually uh, uh, save, 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 save families, mm. yes, and lives, yes. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it sounds like even the people at the NHIF desks don't know, eh? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because you hear all the complaints that you get is yeah. somebody has gone to a health facility, they've been sent to the NHIF desk yeah. for approvals, and the person just looks at you, sizes you up, and decides... 5,000 for you. This one, you... 25, 26,000. I mean, do they know what they're supposed to be yeah. <laughs> giving you as a, as a benefit? They, do they know? Yeah. That is one of the key areas that we have cured mm -hmm. in the new contracts. How? We have standardized that reimbursement. We have put that reimbursement in a matrix in the system. So that discretion of Eric, you've smiled at me and uh, you've bought me coffee, so let me adjust your rate, mm. will be a thing of the past. And that is a key, key milestone that we had to make. And we want to walk this journey together because that standardization is what also now will create that transparency. Because now this information should be publicly available, then you know. Then um, if, if you're not getting your rights, then also we have the you know communication channels yeah. to air your your grievances okay yeah um somebody on twitter is saying that our only claim to uhc is that we've paid nhif for one million indigents <coughs> who are the beneficiaries does anyone know them the beneficiaries and um this was a great exercise actually in uh and painstaking actually in, in identifying mm. but i'll tell you uh in identifying the indigents there's a tool that was developed between um, Ministry of Health, mm -hmm. the Department of Social Protection, and the county government, mm. uh, in, together with NHIF. And this tool is to identify those who cannot afford those basic necessities of life. Mm -hmm. And uh, the information came from the counties, yeah, mm -hmm. and um, escalated through the Ministry of Health to NHIF, which we also still subjected to our internal checks. And uh, initially, about um, close to 20 to 30 percent were returned to get uh, more names. So that list of the indigents is actually vetted. There's a tool which was developed jointly by the Ministry of Health, uh, Department of Social Protection, and the counties. But we are still looking at developing and, and ensuring that process is even more transparent. And not just that, that we actually get that indigent at the grassroots. Mm. And that question about our only claim to 
um, um, UHC is sponsoring the one million indigents. It's good for us to understand what really is NH not is UHC, yes. and I will not define it because mm. UHC is basically uh, 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 ensuring that no one suffers that financial hardship. Mm. But what are the pillars for it? One of them. So if you're talking about financial hardship, is economic empowerment. Mm -hmm. What does economic empowerment mean? If if you are rich enough to pay for all medical services, then you have, you can say you're in a state of UHC, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. you can afford it. But is that possible? No, it is not. And we know healthcare is expensive, and healthcare uh, continues costs continue to spiral. So how do you economically empower? Is by transferring risk, and that is why we are ensuring that people join NHIF. Because now here, by transferring risk, you pay 17 shillings a day, it is put in a pool, and the day you'll need treatment for half a million, it is there for you. Mm -hmm. Now, this risk transfer and economic empowerment is one side. Mm -hmm. The next side is ensuring that everybody is on board. So ensuring everybody is on board. Uh, do and Massey, you, your employer, deducts that so it's your contribution mm. but there's somebody out there who cannot afford mm -hmm. now it is there in the act now that we identify and support them so the one million households that are being paid for now is only 20 percent we have 5.1 million households and we know that that status of being an indigent varies it changes mm. mm -hmm. you can angukia mamili Mm. And uh, your status changes or something can happen catastrophic and you go into. So mm. it's a process that should happen every year. So we need to look at how to ensure the 5.1 million or mm. thereabout are actually known and supported. Then that is a state of UHC. But it won't become a state of UHC when the final pillar is also working. And that is the benefit. The benefit, what benefit are you getting? Mm -hmm. Where are you getting it? How are you getting it? Now, we've worked on the benefits, and if you've seen the history of NHIF, we've been evolving in the benefits we're providing because we're addressing the acute needs. Mm. We have a 12-point criteria that we select the benefits that have the biggest impact to our members of catastrophic expenditure or debilitation. So that is the benefit that we've worked on. The next part is where the facilities. The facilities must work. That is why our partnership with both public-private is important, but more so because public facilities account for over 70% of our provider panel. They must be working. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes now a state of UHC. And what is the beauty about it? It is a, a, a cycle that members go there, they get services, we reimburse the hospital. Mm. So they are healthy. They're able to earn their living, they're able to pay their contribution or supported, and the cycle continues. Mm. Then we're in a state of UHC. Mm -hmm. And actually, I can see that light mm -hmm. at the end of the tunnel. And it's not a train mm. coming. <laughs> How far? It is, it is very, right now, if, if you actually ask me if we can have all indigents actually the identify and the, the, the balance of four, mm. actually, is about four million balance mm. identified and supported. And especially the public and county hospitals working mm. we are in a state mm -hmm. okay. so that and that is key so that is where our focus should be and that's why even in our partnership with the counties to ensure also that they're able to claim from nhif so that we're able to reimburse them mm. yeah and also to other measures to support you know you reduce fraud waste and abuse as well so mm. that the funds are available to be able to expand mm -hmm. so from from what i get huh? Um, NHIF has a focus on mainly curative services, secondary care, tertiary care. But then looking at the administration where we are in, their intent, according to the manifesto, is to focus on primary health care, which is 50% of the budget. How does NHIF um, adjust or fit into what the government of the day wants to yeah. do? Yes, to, to get to UHC, actually all those um, um, aspects are important, both primary and preventive care, and then curative and up to rehabilitative care. Mm. Now, uh, let's start with now NHIF first. NHIF is an insurer. It means that we collect contributions mm -hmm. and have a certain defined set of benefits that we pay out. So that means the scope has to be limited to that. 
but and of course there is also the saying that um, uh, 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 prevention is is better and cheaper. Cheaper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But what is that cost of prevention and who should do it? Mm. The aspects of prevention that we can do and be able to pr project like uh, vaccinations, yeah, mm -hmm. like the KP we, we pay for. In the, the new benefit cycle, we've expanded the, the, um, the, some of the you know, tests to, to prevent and early detection like fluoroscopy, the mammographies, which we've included. Mm -hmm. So all that is there. But the primary care where you are at the grassroots uh, doing prevention, having uh, community health workers, that also needs to be a function of the government, the county government at the grassroots, so that it segues and all that is prevented at that level because mm. it's it's beyond just sending information and whatever. It's also about clean water. Mm. It's also mm. about other preventive measures. So that needs to be a function there. And in fact, it was a question that was actually raised the other time. Oh, why can't you even do something for prevention of cancer of the cervix? And we did a simulation. If mm. you look at the susceptible population, it would cost the fund $18 billion to have a preventive program for, uh, let's say, cancer of the cervix. Mm. So obviously, as an insurer, that is not sustainable mm. because insurance you're paying for what might or might not happen mm -hmm. and it's a projection and our contributions are finite so here is where we work together with the government. Uh, the government and the county government so that the primary care you know like level one in the CAF levels mm. is taken care of mm. and then where we take over from is from level two mm. to level six mm -hmm. would um ring fencing funds all health funds, including NHIF, yes. going to the <coughs> counties and especially our public health facilities, um, add any value to the benefits and to the services that the citizens are getting? Yeah. Actually, that is the silver bullet to close that gap of, of uh, benefit and facilities mm -hmm. because their reimbursements that we give the hospitals are enough to actually sustain the operations of any institution that sees our members. Mm. So ring fencing there also has, it has many advantages. Uh, number one is that that institution also becomes responsible for its bottom line. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they work towards improving the benefits and the services that are offered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it creates um, um, a, a conducive environment to build and improve the capacity of our uh, public institutions. Mm -hmm. And that is something that we've been working with the Council of Governors and imploring that they, they work on the PFM Act, the mm -hmm. Facility Improvement Fund, mm -hmm. to ensure that those funds for the hospitals, and at the end of the day, there would actually be some returns which can be used for other development. Mm -hmm. But uh, the funds indeed, and that's what we would, would promote. And you can see the result of that in other institutions. Mm -hmm. Like I was in a um, a faith-based um, institution about six months ago and they've done a big four-story uh, new hospital state-of-the-art uh, you know theaters yep. and mm -hmm. they say that was all from legit mm -hmm. NHIF reimbursement mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it is mm -hmm. something that we should encourage mm -hmm. from from the list of the facilities um, unfortunately I think out of the top 30 I'm only seeing three public hospitals. Kenyatta is top of the list, got 1.8 billion in 2021. Moi Teaching and Referral, 713 billion. Then the next one mm -hmm. is uh, Coast General at number 29 at 139 million shillings, 713 million, sorry. Mm -hmm. And the other one is 139. But the rest are either private Between hospitals. Between number two and number 20 is private and faith-based. And faith-based hospitals. Yes. So what is happening with our public facilities? Yeah. Yet we know there are so many of them, yeah. big facilities of the that are even level five, level six. Yeah. Some of the hospitals here are level four, level three private hospitals. Yeah. So what's happening to our public facilities? You know, um, numbers don't lie. Yeah. Mm. And um, that is um, a demonstration of how when you invest in the hospital, mm -hmm. that... And, and, and patients, because our operation is, uh, there's clinical freedom, patients have a choice. Yep. And uh, where do patients go? They go where they trust, where because they, this is a business of trust. Mm -hmm. yeah? And we also did the research to show why are they going to certain facilities and not others. The number one reason that came out was consistency. 
and its consistency of service and quality and even just trust. Mm -hmm. And now you can see, as even public hospitals are investing more in the institutions, it is paying off because the number of patients that are going there is increasing. And in fact, even the statistics now of this immediate past year, mm -hmm. there are more public hospitals um, uh, in that uh, uh, top 20 or top 100. Why? Because of investments. And you can single out a couple of, um, of uh, counties that that has happened. Look at Nakuru County, the mm. Nakuru uh, Level 5, PGH, mm. uh, uh, the Nyeri uh, um, Level 5, uh, and many other um, um, institutions. Mm. And uh, look at KUTRRH, actually, mm. is up there. And right now, even um, some of the services not even available in pub private hospitals are available there at KU. At KU. Mm. And, um, and you can see this is a concerted effort of the government and also the county government Mm. to ensure and you see that an investment in ensuring services are available mm. then patients would definitely go and the reimbursements from nhif would promote the facilities dr you need to keep coming back now this time not at between january the next time coming <laughs> september no <laughs> yes. this is september before the end of the year come back like twice yeah mm -hmm. and one of these times you open up the phone line so you get the feedback directly and questions from the people absolutely thank you very much for joining us thank you very much um mercy eric and do it has been a pleasure and i'm looking forward this is your scheme so uh let's uh, keep informing people Indeed. Indeed. We're here for that. Yeah. Dr. Peter Camuño, CEO NHIF. Dr. Marcy Korir is a CEO of Editorial <laughs> Board on <laughs> Matters of Health. And have a lovely weekend, folks. We'll see you again on Monday. It's 10 a.m.